Good afternoon. Thank you very much for the invitation to speak um, to CARTA. Um, I'd like to begin, as I do in my adopted homeland, Australia, by acknowledging the native tribes who were once the sole owners of the land on which we are meeting. Archaeologists should always be mindful of and respectful about the indigenous people whose past we study. I've been asked to talk about stone tools and human cognition. I might have chosen a different topic if I'd been given free reign. But as it happens, last week I, I was in the field near Cloncurry and my Aboriginal friend Gordon Connolly took us to a quarry. Here we found these artefacts, which we may identify. I've marked them. They weren't actually marked like that in the field. Um, <laughs> which we may identify more or less as an Alderwan chopper, an Acherlian hand axe, a Lavalois core, a Mousterian scraper, and an Upper Paleolithic blade. A classification that has its roots in the 19th century. And I wondered what we might make of that. The study of how stone tools contribute to the grand narrative of human evolution is dominated by that set of named industries, mostly known from studies in Western Europe and, uh, and Africa, and related to the types at this one quarry in Australia. Thinking about the application of these labels in Australia opens up our understanding of the significance of stone tools for researching the, the evolution of cognition. The study of cognitive evolution must go beyond the artefact forms that allow these labels and classifications. So to develop this argument, my talk has four steps. We need a definition of cognition, or we will not know what we're talking about. Everyone thinks cognition happens in the brain, so we need to say something about brains. And if we're talking about the evolution of cognition, we need to talk about changes in brains. Then, if we want to understand the evolutionary processes, we need to think about how human cognition is different from that of our common ancestor with other apes. And finally, we need to think about how cognitive changes can be inferred by understanding stone tools. I argue that the processes involved with stone tool making and use were one of the selective contexts in which cognition changed. And I've got to do all that in 18 minutes. George Miller originally defined cognitive science as aiming to, quote, discover the representational and computational capacities of the human mind and their structural and functional realization in the human brain. Implicit in this definition is the understanding that we cannot understand the mind simply by looking at the brain. We need to look at representation, computation, and function, not just at structure. Increasingly, there is an understanding that cognition is also a product of interactions of people with other people and between people and things. Brains do not fossilize. So any statement about structural and functional realization in the remote past is an inference from the fuzzy evidence preserved on the inside of the skull. Going beyond the surface of the brain, understanding the capacities of the human mind in the past depends on inferences about past behavior using direct evidence from the archaeological record or from arguments about mental processes derived from observation of modern apes and humans. All of which means that there has been a lot of development of theory, much of it contentious, about how to interpret the interactions between the mind and brain in the past. Let us begin with brains. Brain size is an unreliable guide to anything. That's why I'm concentrating on it. And internal organization is more important. But I believe there is one important point about brain size. We need to consider the relation between brain size and body size. Big animals have big brains because they are big, not necessarily because they are somehow cognitively better. For technical reasons, the only way to get over the problems of the long-term interaction in hominins um, is to consider the pattern of changes over time in brain size, the darker colors on this graph, and body size, the paler colors. There were two major episodes of change. In the first, the range of brain sizes increased, apparently followed by an increase in the range of stature. There were later selection against brains smaller than 700 milliliters and stature below 1.4 uh, meters. I suggest that more of the early brain size increase is related to, was related to body size increase than is generally acknowledged. But the timing makes it a difficult argument. In the second episode, stature did not change very much, give or take a couple of basketball players. 
suggesting that this was not about bodies, but probably about the way in which the brain was organized and functioned. And the change at this time was also followed by a selection against brains smaller than 1,000 milliliters, generally. The flakes and cores of the earliest stone tools emerged during the earliest brain size stasis and in different parts of the world continued into the time of the second episode of stasis. They may be related somehow to removing the selection against large brains, perhaps through their role in the acquisition of high quality food. The flakes and cores of stone industries called Acherlian, the foundation stones of our knowledge of human antiquity, began sometime after the first expansion of range of brain size and around the time of the extinction of the small-brained individuals and continued through the second episode of stasis. But they also occur in Australia. The one on the left is from Australia. First peopled after the end of the Acherlian from a region that never had an Acherlian. The Australian evidence demonstrates that the distinctive forms occur without being part of a tradition, and I would argue they have all over the world throughout that one and a half million years. And we need to be aware of equifinality as an explanation for stone artifact similarities. But you cannot simply juxtapose such evidence, rather we must attempt to discuss the theoretical framework in which the interactions took place. Now is the time to go to sleep. In archaeology, we are most familiar with the working memory model of mental functioning through the work of Coolidge and Wynne. Badley and Logie originally defined working memory as comprising those functional components of cognition that allow humans to comprehend and mentally represent their immediate environment, to retain information about their immediate past experience, to support the acquisition of new knowledge, to solve problems, and to formulate, relate, and act on current goals. They defined a multi-component working memory as having four subsystems, the phonological loop, the visuospatial sketch pad, the central executive, and an episodic buffer. A phonological loop is an essential component of the functioning of this model, and it is closely related to the use of language. But that begs the question of whether non-humans, which do not use language, could possibly have working memory as badly conceived it. But no one in this paradigm has developed a model of what cognitive function would be in a hominin before they had modern working memory or language. Barnard described a more complex conceptualization of human cognition, uh, that's the one on the right in case you hadn't worked that out, uh, involving nine subsystems that process different types of sensory sim stimuli but in rather different way, uh, rather similar ways. This model can map onto the elements that characterized Badley's model, but it emphasizes the external connections of individual cognition and that there are separate elements of the central executive that, that process all information seen, heard, or felt in the body. The exciting thing about Barnard's model is that it permits understanding of the cognition of the last common ancestor and intervening hominins. The similarity of form of each of the subsystems in the model allows for the construction of models that account for monkey and for ape cognition. In apes, the linkage between the visual system and the effector system that controls limbs and other bodily functions seems to be controlled by a specialized subsystem that is something like hand-eye coordination. The sixth subsystem model would account for the difference between apes and monkeys, which only have five, particularly in achieving some tasks requiring bodily dexterity, and also in learning through imitation in a process Byrne has described as recognition of essential elements of actions through statistical generalization. The logic of the construction of these models of simpler cognitions also produces an argument about how the nine subsystem model emerged from a supposed six subsystem last common ancestor. This logic predicts that there must have been models with seven and eight subsystems which have only ever been exhibited by non-human hominins. And there, were and there are various consequent predictions about what the cognitive abilities of those hominins must have been. How might this relate to stone tools? Because that is what I was asked to talk about and I'm not straying much beyond that brief, however much I want to. We know that some other apes and at least one monkey species manipulate stones. The fact that gorillas are not known to, 
and that the monkey is a South American species, shows that stone tool use is a convergent behavior in monkeys and humans. Importantly, chimpanzees in the wild flake stone accidentally while cracking nuts, but they do not use the flakes or appear to notice them. Captive bonobos and an orangutan have been taught to make flakes by humans, uh, and they've also been taught to obtain rewards by cutting a string, or should I say severing a string. Only hum hominins appear to have had the natural ability to remove flakes from cores by the intentional application of aimed force. Untaught apes do not. Byrne has argued that apes have many of the necessary cognitive behaviours to do that, but not the ability for accurate aiming. If you get hit by when you go to the zoo, it's not because they're accurate, but just because you happen to notice it. <laughs> I argue that they also do not perceive a need for cutting. A team led by Byrne argued that for many implicit roles, called semantic roles in Fillmore's approach to language, there is a great similarity between humans and chimpanzees. For example, there is implicit agency when the chimpanzee Mike climbed a tree, just as there is when John opens a door. Similarly, the dative role can be seen when one chimpanzee grooms another, as well as when I give something to someone. The issue is whether the apes can extract meaning from these pr performances. One of my projects has been to suggest that the persistence or permanence of stone tools was part of the reason why hominins became differentiated uh, from other apes after the last common ancestor. The same semantic roles can also be found among the early hominins using stone tools. Making stone tools involves striking one stone with another, a hominin but not an ape behavior. In addition, six of these eight hominin examples leave a distinctive material product, a permanent product. Repetition of actions that leave similar material products provides the circumstances for the identification of statistical regularities among these actions and products, not only by us as archaeologists, but by the hominins themselves. I would argue that this was the selective context for hominins to, become, uh, to come to recognize the semantic value of such roles and hence to extract meaning in relation to them. The persistence of the products of the performance of roles impacted hominin cognition. I've also done the same analysis of mark making, the beginnings of picture making. It's possible to define the same roles, but for four of them, the role can only be defined in terms of the mental processes that are conceptually removed from the actions or rules. I've argued that this could only be explicitly represented by the ninth subsystem of Barnard's cognitive scheme. Various comparisons between ape and early hominin technology have emphasized the similarities, such as that between the digging stick and the termite wand. One comparison, this, this comparison uh, by Bill McGrew, uh, compared the, these two tools using Oswald's flawed methodolo methodology to suggest that the termiting wand of the chimpanzee, as uh, being a single strand, could be compared to the Tasmanian digging stick, I would say, and also a medieval sword. But the digging stick requires a stone tool to cut and make it, and generally is embedded in a more complex technology of bags and nets, and often in ritual and mythology. So I think we can list differences between ape and hominin habitual stone use, uh, and I want to add one more. Moore's analysis of the reduction sequence used in Tasmania shows that uh, what elsewhere he has called the basic flake unit. Usable tools were made by the consequent sequential application of simple principles of flake removal. Most napping, most places of the world, most of the uh, hominin evolution has been of this type. But in the Hunter Valley of mainland Australia, and of course lots of other places as Lynn indicated, that bla basic flake unit was the beginning of a more complex process where cores were prepared, then subjected to heat treatment, and then flaked once more to produce more specialist products. These in turn were ultimately hafted, a process that also required the production of the haft and of gum. I use this example to illustrate a feature of stonemaking 
stone tool making that resonates with some research in cognition, particularly in relation to working memory. Much of this research involved testing the ability to remember lists of numbers, making the task more complicated by distracting the attention of the person remembering the numbers um, with a list of words interspersed with them. I suggest that the initial ability to incorporate such tasks, sorry, such distractor tasks, test the extent of our ability to store things in working memory. I suggest that the initial ability to incorporate such tasks into a sequence when they, are com when they completely alter the focus of attention represents a new cognitive ability, one that you have if you've been able to follow my argument despite the distractions of the rock art images. The ability to retain the proposition of the task in memory while your attention is distracted is fundamental to human as opposed to other hominin uh, cognition. So we can add attention distraction, or rather retention despite distraction, to the list of cognitive features of stone tool use. We can attach dates to these cognitively significant events. The ultimate attention distraction retention tasks were the construction of watercraft that brought people to Australia, where either the craft had to be assembled from disparate materials present in different places, or it had to be made by hollowing out a tree trunk with hafted stone tools, in either case for use with nets in another place. Tentatively, I offer the following narrative. Cutting emerged about three and a half million years ago and probably represents the emergence of cognition beyond that of the last common ancestor. Napping is present by two and a half million years ago and represents a clear distinction from the abilities of the last common ancestor in recognition of the capacity of hominins to divide the core into separate usable entities and one of them having a further function related to third objects. I will speculate that this was also the stage at which the seventh subsystem emerged, um, separating the effector subsystem into separate systems relating the limbs on one hand and the articulators on the other, the, the talky bits. Vocal utterance under control separate from emotional states might have been possible at this stage. A further speculation suggests that these two novelties and their connection to meat acquisition and other enhanced food opportunities were associated with the relaxation of selection against large brains and subsequent increases in body, body size. Extension of napping to string together consequent flake removals followed from the emergence of napping and was probably part of the selective context for the emergence of the eighth cognitive no subsystem. This involved the cognitive extension of such consequent strings to combinations of vocal utterances. The cognitive leap to constructing tasks, which involved attention distraction and retention, was achieved by 150,000 years ago. This led in turn to the emergence of the ninth cognitive subsystem by which humans could imagine tools and tasks before they made them and, and create new opportunities that did not arise from the contingencies of their current actions. We can play the game of matching these stages with the classification of fossils with intriguing results, but I do not have time to go uh, on uh, into that mercifully. <laughs> the next slide shows a human skeleton, so if this is problematic for you, please look away until the last slide. So the last twist of the story is as follows. The barriers to colonization of the last new worlds of Australia and the North and hence the Americas were cognitive barriers. They were crossed as a result of the creative conceptualization of solutions to the problem of water crossing and of survival in the North. Watercraft and sewn clothing both involved planning of activities long before their realization, impossible without solving the problem of attention distraction. That was behavioral modernity, us, had really arrived. The skelly's going now. Thank you. <laughs>